We were not permitted out of the camp for the first four weeks. We had a library, however, and a recreation hall with ping-pong tables, card tables and chess sets. Our four weeks of training passed quickly with drill, calisthenics and classes. We were acquiring a general familiarity with military life. At the end of the four-week training period, we were inspected by the camp commander and then released to begin our work detail. On our first workday following our training period, we marched for 40 minutes to a strip coal mine with parade spades on our shoulders. We fell out and stacked our parade spades like rifles in four spade pyramids, and I worried about my spade because I kept it perfectly clean. I hated putting it in the stack with the others from my squad for fear someone would grab mine and leave his rusted one for me to clean. We were then issued working spades. The work we did consisted of removing layers of dirt from veins of coal and loading the dirt onto lorries, small tip-bed freight cars that were pulled by a narrow-gauge steam engine. Brandt did not accompany us on work detail, although we were warned that it was not unusual for him to pop in to check things out. We were given 45 minutes for lunch, late in the afternoon. We would march back to camp, arriving by five o'clock. We would wash and have dinner, followed by assembly, which would feature either singing or a history lesson. At times we also had to do kitchen duty or guard duty, just as in the army, one of our first days at work proved to be especially tiring, because the weather was very hot and humid. The work spade had worn blisters on my hands, and sweat poured from my body, making it extremely desirable to gnats, flies and mosquitoes. To make matters worse, Brandt rode up on a bicycle while we were eating lunch. He parked the bicycle and headed directly for the pyramid of parade spades. You call these clean, he bellowed, kicking the pyramids over, all the spades spattering in mud. I gulped, knowing that mine had been clean, and I had strategically placed it so I would know which one was mine. Now they all lay like identical matchsticks covered with mud. Tonight we will polish spades from ten o'clock until midnight, and we will do it every night until all these spades are clean, he said. A groan arose because we were already exhausted, and knew we had another half day of work in this heat and humidity. At ten o'clock, as promised, we were called together to clean spades. My muscles ached, my blistered hands hurt, and I had someone else's grimy spade. As I scrubbed and scraped with wet sand, Inga's face appeared before me, laughing in an I-told-you-so manner. I blinked her away, only to have Friedrich's face appear with the same look. The only good thing about the endless two hours was that I never saw Brandt's face. In June, we received a five-day furlough to go home. We travelled again by chartered bus from Burglengenfeld to Leipzig. We were unsupervised this time, except for the bus drivers, and we knew each other for the trip home. Our conduct was a good deal more boisterous during the all-day ride, but by the time we reached Leipzig, we had tamed down considerably. As we entered the outskirts of Leipzig, we began to see the familiar Leipzig trolleys, with their distinctive green and beige colour designs that were unique to the city of Leipzig. I had not consciously felt homesick during my three months in labour service, but the sight of the first Leipzig trolley brought an unexpected lump to my throat, and I realised for the first time how much I had really missed my home. The buses took us to Augustus Square, and I caught a trolley to my parents' apartment, arriving in early evening. I cannot describe the feeling of warmth and security that came rushing back when I was in the midst of my family again. My mother's face beamed from ear to ear, and she fed me until I thought I would burst. Fritz asked questions so incessantly that I hardly had a chance to answer them, and Uniform so impressed him that he could hardly await to enter labour service himself. Almost in spite of herself, even Inga was curious about my experience. Her presence reminded me of the muddy spade episode, which I did not mention. My father just smiled happily, and was content to let everyone else have centre stage. After three days at home, we departed by chartered bus again from Augustus Square. The trip back to Burglingenfeld was not as lively or enthusiastic as the trip home had been. I did not know how a few days could make such a difference, but I felt that I was somehow older and more mature when we arrived back at camp that night. We quickly returned to our old routine of calisthenics and jogging after breakfast, marching forty minutes to the strip mine, singing as we went, working all day, marching home, cleaning up, having supper, going to assembly, and going to bed. On weekends we were free from 4pm on Saturday, 
until 10 p.m. on Sunday. Three or four of us would go by train to a nearby city that seemed interesting to us. We would visit the cathedrals and museums and other noteworthy buildings. We would have lunch in a restaurant and go to a movie or maybe to a dance and meet girls. Our parents supplemented our pay, so we could afford to do these things. For our labour, we were paid a half mark a day, which was just enough for snacks and incidentals, and we were paid each week. The final leg of labour service occurred with the selection of those of us who would parade at a huge political rally the government was planning to stage at Nuremberg on September 8, 1936. The army, the Sturmabteilung, the Schutzstaffel, the labour service and the Hitler youth were all to parade in a grand spectacle. Tens of thousands would be participating in the parade. The purpose of the political rally, called the Reichsparteitag, was to unify the German people and to impress the rest of Europe with our military strength and martial spirit. Only those of us who demonstrated the greatest skill on the parade ground were selected. To my delight, I was among the 10% of my Abteilung to go, as was Fischer. Those selected to go to Nuremberg began to work less and do extra drill in preparation for the rally. We practiced drilling by ourselves for two weeks, and then we went to Amberg for two weeks of drilling in a company-sized unit composed of elements from several different labour service Abteilungen. We went to Nuremberg, which was not far away by bus, and we arrived the day before our parade and disembarked from the buses in the city. We marched the two miles from Nuremberg to a virtual tent city that had been erected for all of us who were taking part in the parades, through the traffic-cleared and flag-lined streets of the inner city. The sidewalks were packed with cheering people, and bands were placed at strategic locations, all playing martial music for us to march to. More than 1,500 tents, each accommodating six people, were arranged in neat rows, with grass streets running between the rows of tents. Many tens of thousands of people were participating in the parades, which were to continue for five days. We had already been assigned tent numbers and even bunks in the tents. We arrived in late afternoon, and by the time we got settled in our tents, evening was beginning to descend. We were marched to a huge tent mess hall and fed, then we were marched back to our tents and dismissed. Fisher and I decided to walk around the tent city and see what was going on. It was almost a carnival atmosphere. Everyone was excited about being in Nuremberg on such an auspicious occasion, and everyone knew that Hitler, Goering, Goebbels and all the other high party people would be in the reviewing stand watching us march. The excitement of possibly seeing them swelled in my chest. Lanterns appeared in the tents as darkness began to smother daylight. Card games sprang up in some of the tents here and there. Groups of young men would break lustily into marching songs. The smell of kerosene drifted through the air from kerosene fires that glowed atop ten-foot columns, spaced approximately fifty feet apart in every direction throughout the camp. Everywhere, young men milled about in the grass and dirt streets, talking, laughing, practicing drill steps. Everyone was giddy with excitement and anticipation. I had never seen so many people in one place. We went to sleep that night eagerly anticipating the great honour that tomorrow would bring. At ten o'clock the next morning, we performed a carefully timed march into the stadium. We stood at parade rest and watched a precision presentation by sports units consisting of teenage boys and girls who performed intricate manoeuvres and then marched past the reviewing stand. Shortly before noon, the tension began to rise in us as our turn neared. We still stood at parade rest, facing the reviewing stand, with its enormous granite swastika below the German eagle. Achtung boomed over the loudspeakers, and we snapped to quivering attention. At one command, ten thousand spades went up, with the sun reflecting on them dramatically. The spades would turn with every revolution, the sun flashing on them. On command, we formed a series of large rectangles and then went through a series of manoeuvres with the spades, turning them, putting them up, putting them down, presenting spades, etc., we had to be careful not to bash the man in front of us with the spade. It was heavy, and a spade is more difficult to handle than a rifle. It must have been a tremendous spectacle, and from the reports we received, the Labour Service Parade was the most impressive of the parades that year. Then we were ordered to parade rest, and after some martial music, someone made a speech. From my vantage point as one of 10,000 Labour Service men, I could barely see the reviewing stand, but we all knew that Chancellor Hitler, General Feldmarschall Goering and all the important government figures were there watching us. 
That knowledge induced a peculiar tingle of excitement in us. We felt ten feet tall and indestructible, and this was pageantry of the highest order, and it inspired enormous national pride in us. It was a jubilant extravaganza with the unmistakable message that Germany was being reborn. I felt extremely proud. Back at the camp, we could hardly sit still. We wanted the feverish emotions aroused by the thrilling experience on the parade ground to continue. We were not allowed to leave the camp, however, because our leaders did not want to turn 10,000 keyed-up young men loose on Nuremberg. We were marched back to our buses and put aboard them for the return trip. After the Nuremberg rally, we returned to Burglengenfeld to finish our nearly completed tour of duty with labour service. The rest of it was anticlimactic after the glamour and excitement of Nuremberg, and finally, on September 24, 1936, we had a discharge ceremony, and Abteilungsführer Werner thanked us for our service. We gave back our uniforms, put on our old civilian clothes, received our final pay, and were released to go home. Although we had been brought to Burglengenfeld by chartered bus, we were trusted to return on the train by ourselves. Five weeks later, on October 15, 1936, I boarded the train that would take me from Leipzig to Jena, some 40 miles away, to begin my new life as a soldier in the artillery. My father had been a naval gunnery officer before and during the World War, and all during my childhood he had told me many thrilling stories about the big guns. Whenever I had thought of myself as a soldier, I had always thought in terms of those glamorous big guns. For two years our newspapers had been full of stories about the technological advances that had been achieved in mechanising our modern army, including the artillery, and I had volunteered for the artillery with visions of driving self-propelled mechanised artillery. As the train neared Gina, I saw a large complex of barracks. Turning to the middle-aged man sitting next to me, I asked if he knew what they were. He looked up from his newspaper to tell me they were infantry barracks. A little closer to town was another barracks complex. My seat companion, who was a bit portly and starting to grey at the temples, told me this was the artillery. Then, to my dismay, I saw horse stables and horses, and my heart began to sink. I turned to my seat companion in consternation. You mean they still pull the artillery with horses? I asked, hoping desperately that it was not true. Yes, I'm afraid so, he said softly, sensing my disappointment. Suddenly the artillery lost all its glamour and appeal. Instead of driving massive, mechanised artillery, I would be driving horses. I wanted to turn around and go back home. At the army barracks, an unteroffizier sat at a desk. He asked my name, found it on his list, put a check mark beside it and said curtly, Room 29. He was clearly bored with the routine. When I looked at him quizzically, he responded, Second floor. The door to Room 29 was open and a soldier in uniform sat at a table inside. When I walked up to the doorway, he stood and extended his hand. I am Oberkanonia Bersel, he said. I'm going to be your room elder. I shook his hand and introduced myself. He had me select a bunk, and I unpacked my satchel and stored my belongings in a locker next to the bunk. The room had six bunks and lockers and a large table with six chairs. My other roommates began to trickle in. The first was Ernst Rauscher, who had been an assembly line worker in a factory. The next was named Peter Voltat, a farm boy. Next came Boris Weinreich, a tall, strikingly handsome specimen who was from East Prussia, the son of a schoolmaster. Our final roommate was a city urchin named Vogel, and I went to bed that night still disappointed that the artillery was horse-drawn, but I finally drifted into a sound sleep. A whistle woke us rudely at five o'clock the next morning. Out of bed, Bearsell shouted. God, it's still the middle of the night, Vogel moaned. Well, a little stable duty before breakfast will bring morning around, Bearsell grinned. You have exactly one minute to be assembled in front of the building if you do not want extra duty. We all jerked our heads toward him, startled, and I began frantically to pull on our clothing. Shivering in the early morning cold and darkness, we assembled in front of the building. Bearsell led us to an area and arranged us in a formation with other men from other rooms. Bearsell and the other uniformed room elders remained outside the formation. An Obergefreiter appeared, called us to attention, and marched us to the horse stables. I still could not believe I was actually in the horse-drawn artillery. It all seemed so backward in this modern age. One man per stall, the Obergfreiter instructed. 
We tentatively moved toward the stable. Move it, he shouted. We ran to our posts, selecting our stalls at random. When we had taken up our positions, he called us to attention. I am Obergefreiter Sebastian, and this is stable number one, he bellowed. He was a paunchy older man in his thirties with a moustache. Note the number of the stall behind you when you are dismissed. This will be your permanent stall to keep clean. A shovel is clipped to the post behind you. You will not be trusted with pitchforks for a few weeks, until we can be sure you can handle them without stabbing the horses. The horse in your stall has been haltered and tied. Take careful note of how the halter fits, and how the horse is tied to the ring in the corner of the stall. I will demonstrate it for you once. He disappeared into a stall and re-emerged with a horse in tow. He showed us how to remove and replace the halter, and how to tie a quick-release knot on the lead rope. With his demonstration horse now tied, he showed us how to push the horse's body from side to side, so we could clean the area under it. I only hoped that all the horses were as easy-going as the demonstration horse, and the stable had twenty-three stalls down one side of a large centre aisle, and twenty-three down the other. The horses were tied with their heads too, the wall and their rumps to the centre aisle, and the stalls consisted of beams that hung from the ceiling to separate each horse from the one next to it. Only officers' horses had real stalls. Two wheelbarrows were now pushed into the centre aisle by uniformed soldiers. When you clean your stalls, bring the manure to the wheelbarrows in the centre aisle, then return the shovel to its attached position on the post, the Obergefreiter instructed. Anyone whose stall does not pass inspection will be assigned extra duty. Now fall out and clean your stall. I turned and looked at the rump of my new ward. Great, I thought. Now I am going to be housefrau to a plough horse. I had never been this close to a live horse before. It obviously outweighed me by at least a thousand pounds. It seemed impossible that I could move this huge brute by simply pushing it. I hoped it was a tame one as I removed the small, short-handled shovel and entered the stall. I inched nervously toward my target, wondering what one says to reassure a horse. Stretching the short shovel as far as I could reach, I scooped up the offensive pile of manure and retreated hastily to the safety of the centre aisle, depositing the contents of my shovel into the wheelbarrow. To my delight, the horse had simply ignored my presence. Recalling the Obergefreiter's warning about extra duty, I returned to make sure I had left no traces. The horse turned his head to look at me, took a deep breath and returned to munching hay. I returned my shovel and clipped it securely in place. We were called to attention again, and the Obergefreiter marched us back to the barracks building, where we were informed that we had one hour to clean up and have breakfast. After breakfast, Bearsell instructed us to form a line with the other recruits in the centre hallway of the barracks, and we were led to another part of the building, where our hair was cut very short. Then we were issued two sets of uniforms, one for drill and stable work, and another for everything else. We were also issued riding boots and riding breeches with leather seats, since we were in the horse-drawn artillery. We were especially proud when we were issued steel helmets and cartridge pouches that made us feel more like real soldiers. They tried to give us the right sizes, but sometimes they could not fit us, and we had to take what they had and exchange it later. Although the first day was busy, it included nothing of real substance, mostly just getting us checked in, things did not start in earnest until the next day. Following stable duty and breakfast the next day, we were called into formation and introduced to Unteroffizier Max Kroll. He was a very small man of about 23, with dingy blonde hair, a ruddy scarred face and pale blue eyes. He stepped up onto a portable platform, took a deep breath, puffed himself up to all the height he could achieve from his five-foot, four-inch frame, and stared down his now-raised nose at us for a long moment of silence. I am Unteroffizier Kroll he said finally through clenched teeth. The skin on the back of my neck began to crawl. It is my responsibility to make soldiers out of the sad specimens I see before me, he gritted. Obviously they expect miracles of me, but I'm going to do it if I have to work you day and night for the next 365 days. From the looks of you, that is what it is going to take. He paused, then appearing to draw himself up even straighter, he asked, How many of you are abiturenten? Mispronouncing abitutient, the German word for gymnasium graduate, I raised my hand. I could see Weinreich's hand go up, and I thought I could see two others. Take a good look at me, he growled threateningly. I plan to take especially good care of abiturenten. 
Kral broke us into squads and turned us over to Obergefreiters, whose styles and attitudes were not much different from his. They went to work on us, assuring us that, labour service notwithstanding, we not only did not know how to march, we did not even know how to walk. Then they went about teaching us, in their own way, it was beneath them to recognise our labour service training, so they taught us to march and drill all over again. We were issued rifles and taught how to clean and care for them, as well as how to disassemble and reassemble them. Our instructors disparagingly assured us that we were not carrying spades on our shoulders now. Although we would never have admitted it to our instructors, we were proud to have rifles on our shoulders now instead of spades. In the afternoon, we attended classes on army ranks and on German history before returning to the parade ground for yet more practice and drill. Our training began in earnest the next day with six weeks of infantry training. This included handling our rifles, shooting them on the firing range, moving on the ground under fire and digging in. Of course, that was in addition to marching, drilling and learning to parade. We kept cadence while marching by singing. We also had training with hand grenades and machine guns. This portion of our training was conducted primarily by Stabsgefreiter Weizsacker, who made a special point of riding the gymnasium graduates. All we could do was hunker down and endure his abuse. We received only six weeks of infantry training, compared with twelve months for the infantry soldiers. It was important, however, because the part of the artillery that accompanied the forward observation officer, called the battery troop, was always up front with the infantry. During this infantry training period, we would get up at five o'clock, perform stable duty, have breakfast, fall out, and begin a very full day that ended only when we fell into bed, exhausted, at ten o'clock. The training was interesting, well-planned and well-organised. Lunch was our main meal of the day. The food was good and it was well-prepared. After lunch, we would get fifteen minutes or so of rest. Then we would typically change uniforms. The clothing was prescribed for different activities and get a lecture on espionage or German national history. We stood guard in the stables at night. We had to keep a wheelbarrow handy, and whenever a horse at our end of the stable let something fall, we had to take the wheelbarrow and scoop it up so the horse would not lie down in it. Guard duty was boring and unpleasant, but it was only for two-hour stretches. We had calisthenics regularly, as well as handball training. The batteries played handball against each other or against nearby infantry. Around December 1, 1936, we ended our infantry training and began three months of basic artillery training. We were divided into two groups, those who would handle the horses, usually those from farms, and those who would handle the guns, usually those from the city, although each group had to be familiar with the other's duties. We had to learn everything about the horse side of the business and the gunner's side of the business. Basically, the horse handlers were learning equine care, and how to bridle and harness horses. Those of us who were gunners practised going through the motions of firing, taking the gun off the ammunition cart, placing the gun in the proper position, loading it with a dummy shell and bags of sawdust for powder, aiming it at a fixed point, making corrections, and firing on command. We went through these exercises every day in the training area, just going through the motions without live ammunition. The horse handlers, farers and the gunners, canonias, exercised constantly but separately. A gun crew consisted of one gun leader, an unteroffizier or unterwachtmeister, five cannoneers and three farers. The direction gunner was the key cannoneer because he handled the sighting and the aiming of the gun. The others handled ammunition, loaded the gun and helped camouflage the gun with branches. After a couple of weeks of the cannoneers and farers, practicing separately, we came together for the first time. From then on, farers and canoniers practiced together daily, and once a week all four gun crews would come together and practice as a battery. Christmas was approaching, and we began looking forward to a break in our training routine. Half of us were to get five days of furlough at Christmas, and the other half were to get five days at New Year's. Rausch, Wohitat and Baricel drew Christmas furlough, and Weinreich, Vogel and I received our furloughs at New Year's. When the first group left, just before Christmas, everything seemed suddenly very strange, because our total regimentation had been broken. We had to police the area and keep everything spick and span, but most of our routine training was discontinued until after New Year's, and we had free time to lie around and be lazy. 
Most of the higher-ranking non-commissioned officers had managed Christmas furloughs, leaving mostly Stabsgefreiters in charge. Stabsgefreiters were a unique group in the German army, because this was a rank reserved for losers, career soldiers who could not handle responsibility and would never hold a rank higher than Stabsgefreiter. Christmas furlough was an opportunity for them to exercise authority, however, and they took full advantage of it. The Stabsgefreiter in charge of us in Kroll's absence was Weizsäcker, and we were more than a little apprehensive about him. He seemed to be a very sadistic sort who liked to throw his weight around when he had a rare opportunity. Since Weinreich and I were intellectuals, we knew we would be in trouble if we ever found ourselves at his mercy. Weinreich and I drew stable duty on Christmas Eve, at least we were trusted with pitchforks by now. Stable duty consisted of cleaning the stalls and sorting out the straw. The straw could not be too dirty, so new straw had to be placed on top of the old straw. The underneath mattress of old straw would already be pressed down, and the new straw would be placed on top of that, so the horse would not get dirty when it lay down. The stable had a cement floor, and we had to learn how much straw to take out and how much to leave. About every three weeks all the straw would be removed, the cement floor would be cleaned with water, and all new straw would be put down. An immense amount of new straw was needed to make the required mattress. After enduring the odour of removing the old straw, we found the fresh scent of new straw an unforgettable pleasure. Weinreich and I drew the unenviable duty of removing all the soiled straw from a section of the stall and washing down the cement floor. We had hardly begun when Stabsgefreiter Weizsäcker came marching Vogel into the barn, shouting at him about extra duty. Weinreich and I stopped our work and looked around to see what was happening. The moment we stood up, Weizsäcker pounced on us. The intellectuals are loafing, he shouted gleefully, momentarily forgetting about Vogel. Well, if you have so much free time, I have a perfect solution especially designed for intellectuals and smart mouths. He grinned at Vogel. Weissacker motioned for Vogel to get into the stall with Weinreich and me. Now, let's see you guys clean this place out with your hands. Our expressions must have reflected our shock because he grinned even wider. That's right, he said. Hang up your pitchforks, Vogel started to protest, but quickly thought better of it. Weizsäcker's half-moon grin was topped by a round, bulbous nose and small, close-set eyes. He was obviously enjoying his rare experience with authority. I will be back in thirty minutes, he said, and this stall had better be empty and spotless. He turned and strutted importantly toward the door. Vogel picked up a tiny piece of horse manure and flipped it at the departing Weizsäcker, who fortunately never saw the defiant gesture. We began picking up large sections of packed straw with bare hands, trying unsuccessfully to avoid the overpowering stench of horse urine that arose as the straw was removed, and carrying it to the wheelbarrows. With nearly superhuman effort, we had our part of the stall completely cleaned and washed down when Weizsäcker returned thirty minutes later. He came stalking into the stable, looking smug and self-important, like the Italian dictator Mussolini in newsreels I had seen. When he saw the empty stall, his face fell. He clearly had thought it would be impossible for us to do the job in thirty minutes, and was looking forward to imposing more extra duty on us. He seemed confused upon finding that he had no excuse for further punishment. It is a damn good thing, he muttered, as a way to save face, and stalked out of the stable. It was not exactly an ideal Christmas Eve, but we survived it, and actually in fairly good spirits once the filthy task in the stable was finished. Five days at the mercy of the Stabsgefreiters left me more than ready for my own furlough. Being home again was very pleasant, however brief. The total lack of regimentation seemed unnatural and strange at first. Having my mother hovering to serve my every wish made me feel that I must be in another world, a dream world. My father was interested in comparing my experience to his experience in the Navy twenty years earlier. Fritz, of course, was fascinated with both sets of stories, and sat at our feet as we related them. Inga was friendlier than I could ever remember her being before, but still reserved, Grandma came to visit, of course, and to brag about her handsome young soldier grandchild. My father had got out of the wholesale grocery business and was now operating a restaurant and nightclub. I found Liebelt, Michaelis and Ebert, and learned from them that Friedrich was also home on furlough. I was delighted that we could all get together for an evening before Friedrich had to return to Dresden, where he was in training to become an officer. 
Of course, since he was a Farnan Junker unter Offizier, and I was but a lowly cannoneer, he strutted about, playfully shouting orders at me. We should plan another ski trip to the Sudeten Mountains when Knapper and Friedrich get out of the army, Liebeit suggested. I wonder if old Herr Hoffer would still be there, Friedrich said. I don't know if I will still be in Germany, Michaelis said gloomily. My father is talking seriously about moving to England. He does not trust the German authoritarians because we are Jewish, God, I hope you're still here, Ebert said. It wouldn't be the same without you. Let's toast the five of us, just in case, Michaelis suggested, raising his glass of wine, to us and to the future, and we all drank to Michaelis's toast. Following the wonderfully non-regimented furlough, we quickly fell back into the old routine of training. Actually, the routine felt good to me. Our whole first year was intensive basic training, with manoeuvres in the field once a month. Practice sessions would include pulling the guns, first on the road and then cross-country, and getting into position. The battery commander, a Hauptmann, would select the battery position for the guns and the lieutenants would get the people into place, select the individual positions for the four guns and camouflage the guns. In late January 1937, Weinreich and I were selected for training in communications because of our gymnasium education. The battery troop, which was always up front with the infantry, and the gun crews communicated by both wireless radio and telephone. This required a radio operator and a telephone operator up front with the battery troop, and another of each back with the guns. Wireless radio was cutting-edge technology in 1937, and I was very proud to become a radio operator, even if it was in the horse-drawn artillery. My training as a communications man also included measuring angles, estimating distances, and all the things the forward observation officer had to know, so that I could do his job if he was killed or badly wounded. Fairly often in combat, the communications man would have to assume these duties, and we practiced this constantly. Now that I was a communications specialist, I had to learn how to ride a horse, as a city dweller, I had to get accustomed to handling these huge animals, but it did not take long. We had to learn to brush and feed the horses, each of us had two to look after, and to saddle them. We had riding lessons an hour a day for about ten weeks, under the tutelage of Obergefreiter Sebastian. It was winter, so we would lead our horses into the covered riding arena. The riding class was ten to twelve riders, and most of us were new and inexperienced with horses. Leading our horses, we would march into the riding arena, and learn how to stand the right distance from each other in a straight line in the middle of the arena. Then we learned how to mount a horse, how to hold the reins, and what to do and not do. In the summer, the battalion, all three batteries, came together for the first time, and in late summer we worked together with the infantry for the first time. For this, we had to leave Jena, our garrison town, and go to a military reservation at Jutebog near Berlin, where we could fire live ammunition. Working with the infantry was the highlight of our training. We seldom practised with the infantry in garrison because of limited space, with the farms all around. We could practise in the fall, after the crops were in, but even then a lot of damage was done, and the farmers did not like it. We had to take the farmers' fences down, and then put them up again. We had to be very careful with the fences, which was time-consuming and difficult. We marched from Jena to Jutebog, we were roused out of bed at 4.30am and had an hour to feed and water the horses and have our own breakfast. Then we hitched the teams to the guns and wagons and moved out. The infantry led the way, with the artillery following. The infantry marched on foot, and we in the artillery either rode on horseback or rode on the guns or wagons. The guns were pulled backward, with their barrels pointing behind us, and the battery commander led the 8th battery on horseback followed by the forward observation officer with the battery troop. Then came the battery officer with the four gun crews and the ammunition and supply wagons. Suddenly we received word that the infantry in front of us had encountered resistance and we were to deploy and support the infantry. The battery commander and the forward observation officer with the battery troop moved up to join the infantry. After being advised of the infantry battle plan, the battery commander rode back to instruct the battery officer and determine the gun positions, designating the exact spot for each of the four guns. The guns were unhitched and positioned by hand by the canoniers. The ammunition was unloaded from the limbers, which the farers then took back to cover, where they dismounted and cared for their horses. 
The battery officer selected a reference point that could be seen from the gun position. The forward observation officer selected a target for sighting purposes and gave directions to the battery officer, as well as the position of his reference point, who then gave orders to the gun crew of gun number two, which did the initial sighting for all four guns. After each round, the forward observation officer called back adjustments, and when gun number two was zeroed in, all the guns fired on the target, live ammunition for the first time, and the roar of the guns was deafening. When we received word that the enemy resistance had been broken, the farers rode back to the gun positions and hitched the horses to the guns. We communications people restored our equipment to their containers and remounted them on our horses. We then resumed our cross-country march, but we were all flushed and excited from actually going through the whole coordinated action and firing live ammunition for the first time. We were considerably less disciplined than we had been before, but only for a short while. We were soon back in our disciplined routine. While we were at Utabog, Hitler ordered a big parade for the benefit of Mussolini, who was visiting Germany and whom Hitler wanted to impress with German military might. I think this was one of the few times when a whole division went on parade, as participants, unfortunately, all we saw was dust, with an artillery regiment of four battalions totaling 48 cannons, each pulled by a team of six galloping horses. Nearly 300 horses and 100 cannon wheels raised so much dust that not only could we not see, we could barely breathe. On the weekends back at Jena, we could get a pass to go to town unless we had stable or guard duty. Weinreich and I had become good friends and usually went to town together, as in labour service, my weekend passes were usually spent in a combination of cultural pursuits and meeting girls and dancing. One day in the spring of 1937, I was instructed to report to Lieutenant Badstubner's office. This was my first personal contact with an officer. I reported to him in his office as ordered, and he cordially invited me to take a seat. I understand that you plan to attend university after your army service, he said. Javol, Herr Lieutenant, I replied. What would you think about attending a military officer? He asked. In academy, and becoming a reserve stead of two years, you would have to serve three, but then you would have no reserve duty obligations and would be completely free to attend university and study. That sounded logical to me, and I was enjoying army life. So why not? Jawohl, Herr Leutnant, I replied. I would like that. Weinreich and two other gymnasium grad also been invited to become officer candidates. So we now had additional training, as well as some duties of non-commissioned officers. Lieutenant Badstubner was responsible for our training and special duties. He was only a couple of years older than we were, and not long out of the military academy himself. Our military training was now stepped up. Normally, our second year in the army would have been a repetition of our first, except that in the second year we would have taken over some supervisory duties. But because we were in officer training, we began learning military tactics. We began to learn the observation officers and battery officers' jobs. We were put into command positions to learn leadership and how to use our voices to command troops. In training new troops, we did the same job as the non-commissioned officers. Some of the non-commissioned officers were friendly, but some of them resented us because they were older and they knew that one year later we would be lieutenants and they would still be non-commissioned officers five years from now. There were four ranks for officer candidates. The ranks were Fahnen Junker Gefreiter, equivalent to Gefreiter, and Fahnen Junker Unteroffizier, equivalent to Unteroffizier, before we went to the academy. Halfway through the military academy, we would become Fuhnrich, and at graduation from the academy, we would be promoted to Oberfuhnrich, which was almost an officer. On June 1, as an officer candidate, I became a Fahnen Junker Gefreiter, I would otherwise have qualified for Gefreiter rank only after one year. Stab's Gefreiter Weizsacker was bitter at the thought of a first-year recruit suddenly almost equaling him in rank, and he knew that I would outrank him in a few months. He, of course, would never be more than a Stab's Gefreiter, regardless how long he stayed in the army. I could sympathise with him, but he was still a little hard to take at times. The Farnen Junker Gefreiters stayed in the same barracks, and we did the same things as the others except that on certain days, at certain times, we came together and had special training. The special training made our lives more interesting. Those of us in officer candidate training also had increasingly more contact with the officer corps. They had regular social events, to which we were occasionally invited. 
The dances were attended by daughters of the older officers and by local business and professional people and their daughters. The dances and social events provided us with excellent opportunities to develop and practice our social skills. We went out with the other enlisted men to help the farmers with their harvest during the latter half of July 1937. It was fun, it was a nice break in routine for us, and it was a great help for the farmers. Of course, we were all accustomed to working with horses, and many of the soldiers were accustomed to farm work. We sang as we went to work in the fields, and we thoroughly enjoyed helping the farmers out. They were very appreciative, and they fed us extremely well. On September 1, 1937, I was promoted to Fanen Junker Unteroffizier. On October 1, after one full year in the army, I received a 10-day furlough before reporting to the military academy in Potsdam. Weinreich and I were both assigned to Kriegsschule Potsdam near Berlin, arrived at Kriegsschule Potsdam in mid-October 1937, looking forward to an exciting new experience. I took a train to Potsdam, a relatively small town near Berlin, and then caught a bus to the school, arriving in late afternoon. Kriegsschule Potsdam was a very large and modern complex, surrounded by a wrought iron fence on a concrete base. The whole complex looked very military and official. A gefreiter at the gate inspected my orders and directed me to the administration building. There a clerk directed me to room 17C, where I found a Leutnant seated at a wooden desk. I am Leutnant Brecker, he said. Welcome to Kriegsschule Potsdam. I am going to be your platoon leader while you are here. He sat back down at the desk, opened a folder, and began to look through some papers as I stood before the desk. A photograph of Chancellor Hitler adorned the wall in back of the desk, along with a lithograph of General Feldmarschall von Blomberg, Commander-in-Chief of the Wehrmacht. You established quite a good record at Jena, the Lieutenant commented finally. I am sure you will do just as well here. You have been assigned to Barrack 3, Sweet L, and your training will begin tomorrow morning. I crossed a parade ground to four barrack buildings, where I found Barrack 3 and Suite L, and learned that a suite consisted of a large study room with four desks and a large bedroom with four beds, four lockers, and four individual washing facilities. Weinreich greeted me at Suite L, a big smile on his face. Welcome to the manor, Herr Knapper, he said. I looked at him with both surprise and suspicion. Are we rooming together again? I asked. The reply was no, so I asked the Leutnant if he would put us together. He said with a shrug and a palms-up gesture. He could not, because every suite must have people from different branches of the service. But I am in the suite next door. My other roommates arrived during the afternoon. One was an infantryman named Hans Bottler. Another was a cavalryman named Gustav Hoffmann. And I don't remember the fourth one. Since we had no duties for the rest of the day, we all decided to explore the layout of Kriegsschule Potsdam. The parade ground was the centre of the whole complex. On one side of the parade ground were the four barrack buildings, and on the other side was the administration building. To one end of the parade ground was the mess hall, which included a lounge where students could have a drink. Behind the barracks were the training area and the stables. Immediately behind the administration building were four classroom buildings, and beyond them were an indoor swimming pool, a large gym, and several tennis courts. Overall, the place was quite impressive, with its manicured grounds and neat new brick buildings. After a breakfast the next morning, we were all called to an assembly, where we were greeted by the commander of Kriegsschule Potsdam, Oberst Wetzel. We learned that we were but one of four Kriegsschulers, and that the others were at Munich, Hanover, and Dresden. Anyone who became an officer at that time had to graduate from one of them. Each had approximately a thousand students. We were then divided into two groups of 500 each, labelled Group A and Group B. Sweet L was assigned to Group B. Each group was commanded by an Oberstleutnant, Group A by Oberstleutnant Johannes Friebner, and Group B by Oberstleutnant Irvin Rommel. Rommel's name meant nothing to us then, but we would soon learn that he had been quite a hero in the World War, and that even today, at the age of 45, he was something of a celebrity in the German army. His feats of bravery and effectiveness in combat were astounding. We learned that he had received the Pour le Merite, Germany's highest decoration, during the World War as an Oberleutnant in the Alpine Corps on the Italian front. He had been a brilliant tactician even then, and he had just this year, 1937, published a book on tactics called Infantry Attacks, 
which we were to use as a textbook. Once a week we were to have an assembly of both groups, at which Rommel would teach tactics. Within each group were 16 platoons of 32 men each, and each platoon was commanded by a major, who was assisted by a lieutenant. After the commander's presentation, Rommel was introduced and gave a little speech about the importance of a strong officer corps, and what an honour it was for us to be selected to become officers in the German army. We were then separated into platoons and introduced to our platoon commanders. Mine was Major Kassnitz, a man of about 40, with thinning hair that was already turning grey. We got another short speech from him. He told us that at the academy we would be taught to lead an infantry battalion in combat. We would all be treated as infantry, even though many of us were in the artillery, the cavalry and the panzers' tanks. Our training began immediately, and continued without let-up until Christmas. We studied only military subjects, because we were all gymnasium graduates who had just completed 13 years of intensive academic studies. Our major subject was tactics, and we spent most of our time on it. Other subjects included topography and reading maps, engineering, mostly building and blowing up bridges, basic artillery, horseback riding, drilling on the parade ground with rifles, cooperation with the Luftwaffe and physical education. We spent six hours each day in the classroom and three hours in the field. We learned everything an infantry battalion commander had to know in any kind of pre-combat or combat situation. At the end of our training, we would theoretically be able to command an infantry battalion in combat. Every week we would have a test that was graded, very much as in gymnasium. We were not normally assigned homework during the week. In the evening we would look over what we had studied during the day and go over it again, so the next day we would be better acquainted with what had been discussed. We got homework every second or third weekend, in an attempt to put us under stress similar to a combat situation. They gave us very little time to do the assignment. They would give us a situation in which we were a battalion commander. Our battalion was given a certain goal for the day, and we were marching to meet that goal. Suddenly we would receive a message that the enemy had been spotted. Then we might get a contradictory message. Then we would encounter something else that would alter the situation. The problem was written out, and we would read it as if we were seeing it. From all the information given us, we had to make our decision. Three or four possibilities might be equally correct. We had to judge the situation and make a decision on the basis of what we knew. We had to write the orders we would give to implement that decision. We had to explain why we made the decision. It was not so much that we had to make a patent decision as how we came to it, how we defended it, and how we executed it. We would go out in the field and play battalion commander. One person would be designated as the battalion commander, and the others would make up his staff. The staff would include an adjutant, an executive assistant to the commander, principally for administrative duties, three company commanders, a communications officer, and so on. An assault had to be prepared and orders issued. Major Kassnitz would make the assignments and distribute the rules for playing. Then he would keep notes on how well everyone handled himself. Sometimes the school commander, Oberst Wetzel, would also observe. And after the exercise in the field, we would go back to the academy in a bus. Often the most warlike action of the day was the run toward the bus to get one of the better seats. In tactics, we studied how to attack how to retreat, how to march, and so on. We studied military history, mostly Prussian battles from the 17th and 18th centuries and battles from the Great World War. We studied how tactics and strategy were used in the battles. Often our three hours a day in the field would be infantry practice, for which we would wear our field uniforms, steel helmets and gas masks. We would march about 20 minutes from the academy with machine guns and the ammunition for them. We would march and then deploy, we marched three abreast. Then when we came under fire, one person went left, one went right, and one went straight down. We would practice attacking, defending, retreating, and so on. And we did this to make sure that everyone knew infantry tactics, even if he was in the artillery or panzers, because tactics usually determined the outcome of a battle. We also did some basic infantry training, like target shooting, firing machine guns, throwing hand grenades, and so on. Sometimes in engineering we would go out and lay barbed wire and put up anti-tank obstacles. We learned where to apply dynamite to a bridge so it would collapse and not remain usable. We also studied how to deal with mines, 
We studied all these things both in the classroom and in the field, and we had to take riding lessons also, even those of us in the cavalry and artillery who already knew how to ride. Our lives were quite pleasant at Kriegsschule Potsdam. We could study in our room, which was equipped with four desks and chairs. The mess hall was not much different from the soldiers' mess at Jena, a large hall with tables for ten or twelve people each. The mess hall was used only for the noon meal. We were issued a two-pound loaf of commisbrot or army bread every other day, which we kept in a special food compartment of our lockers. For breakfast, we would have commisbrot, butter, jam and coffee. Somebody had to go to the mess hall every morning and get the butter, jam and coffee and bring them back to the suite. For our evening meal, someone would also go to the mess hall to get butter and either liverwurst or cheese to go with our commisbrot, and we would also eat this in our suite. We had a lounge adjoining the mess hall where we could go at night and on the weekends and have a drink if we had the time. We could order beer, wine, cognac or any other kind of drink. On rare occasions, someone would get drunk, but learning to drink socially without getting drunk was part of the training. An army officer who could not hold his liquor would present a bad image. Sometimes we drank a lot if we had something to celebrate, but almost everyone knew how to handle it. As students, we sometimes made excursions away from Potsdam. Major Kassnitz would go with us on these trips, because he had to observe us in all kinds of different environments. Some of the excursions were for skiing, a skill considered necessary for winter combat, and others were to visit different battlefields. We made one early trip to East Prussia that lasted two weeks. On one trip, we spent a week skiing in the Sudeten Mountains, and I thought often of my trip with Michaelis, Liebbeit, Ebert and Friedrich. At each battlefield we would study the campaign and then go and tour the battlefield to get a feel for how these battles were fought flank attacks, retreats, defence, counter-attacks. We would study the battle in the classroom, and then when we visited the battlefield one of us would be designated to explain the battle. Then Major Kassnitz would criticise our explanation of the battle. It would be an all-day affair. On the way to a battlefield we might visit a castle or a fortress. The excursions gave us some historical insights in addition to military insights. We studied the tactics of Alexander and Caesar, the Battle of Hastings and Roman and Greek battles. We learned why things went right and why things went wrong. Sports were an important part of academy life. Tennis courts were available if we cared to play. Some sports were required such as swimming, high diving, boxing, fencing and horseback riding. In addition to enhancing physical fitness, the sports were intended to test our courage and make us competitive. I started training for the modern pentathlon, which consisted of fencing, pistol shooting, horseback riding, 10-kilometer cross-country running, and 1,000-meter swimming. Every day for some time I ran 10 kilometers and swam 1,000 meters before going to bed. It was terrific training. Others played tennis and swam, and some just went to the lounge and had a drink, Sometimes on the weekends when we did not have homework, we rented horses and went sightseeing. Potsdam was both colourful and historic, and these excursions were always interesting. Social affairs were arranged so we could practice our social graces and be observed and evaluated. We often had dances to which daughters of the older officers were invited. Anyone who had not learned how to dance properly had to learn now. There were dance schools in Potsdam for those who needed them. The dances were held in a large ballroom with live orchestras. Many of the officers at the Kriegsschule and their wives attended these dances. They were quite formal. The men wore dress uniforms and the women wore ball gowns. There were perhaps four dances during the nine months I was at Potsdam. Major Kassnitz was always watching and evaluating us, and his wife and his two teenage daughters also attended the dances.